Hey guys, this is Brian Ellis, and welcome to The Fail Journal. My hope is to inspire people to chase their dreams and pursue their passions by taking risks and embracing the lessons taught by my favorite coach and mentor, failure. Here we go. Let's do this. You know what? I'm just going to jump straight into this because here's the thing, guys. This is uh, episode 11, I believe, in the Fail Journal podcast episode. Episode podcast of the, of the episode is just things. And... Um, I still get nervous before hitting the cameras on and turning the light, you know, having everything going because you got these bright lights in my face and get this camera that's moving back and forth and we got this camera staring directly at me and I'm looking into the abyss and I'm just like, there's still these like nerves that come up in me that's like, ooh, like those butterflies, you know? And um, I'm being vulnerable with you guys here because even when I was coming into the podcast episode, I sat down, I'm like, oh man, I don't feel like filming right now. I just want to procrastinate. I want to go to home. I want to go home, lay in bed and watch Netflix. And just to give you guys some encouragement, like <laughs> it's not easy for anybody to, to start something, to go for it, to put yourself out there, to sit and speak into a microphone and give people your opinions. Like it's not just easy for people. Um, confidence comes through repetition, right? So comp confidence comes through repetition and then it, it actually, it grows familiarity. And with that familiarity, become less and less intimidated and it becomes easier and easier. So obviously from now to the first episode of the podcast, like I feel a lot more confident. I have a little bit of a smoother flow. Uh, it's getting a lot more fun interviewing guests. I'm getting better questions, things like that, but it's all process. Nobody sits down on their first day and is perfect. So your ideas, the things you guys are going after, so many people. I don't think I've met a single ambitious person who's like, I don't want to do a podcast. Or I don't want to write a book. Everybody wants to do something. Everyone wants their, their voice to be heard, especially the ambitious people, the dreamers. Sit down and do it. It's not going to be fun at first. It's going to be uncomfortable at first. You'll feel a little insecure at first, and that's totally fine. That's just part of the journey. It's part of the process. So I'm sitting my butt down. I'm avoiding the procrastination. In my head today, I was getting my hair cut, and I was like, oh, I think I'm just going to cancel the podcast today. And I'm like, no. Damn it, you're going to sit down and you're going to film this podcast whether you like it or not. <laughs> it's consistency, repetition, breeds some good stuff. So guys, today's an exciting episode. I'm going to be doing Q&A. So I think last week I posted on my Instagram and said, hey, for you guys who have questions on failure and the topic of running after and pursuing your dreams, taking risks, let me hear those questions. So I'm stoked. I got some good questions from you guys. Some of these questions are a little weird. Some of them I forgot to write down, so I just don't get butthurt if I don't read your question um, because I didn't mean to. It wasn't intentional because even some of these questions that are re weird, I'm going to attempt to answer <laughs> just for the fun of it. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for this episode. So here we go, guys. I'm just going to jump right into the questions. Uh, the first one I have is how to grow in creativity and... I like this question a lot. Creativity is everything. Um, one thing I learned early on several years ago, uh, probably actually 18, because I grew up in a home where I, you know, I'm, I'm the second oldest of six kids. And so my older brother, you know, he, I saw him as just like a creative genius. It, it was just like every thing we did in school, it felt like he did it a little bit better. Every time we had a writing assignment, I would look at mine and look at his and be like, oh man, he's so much more creative than me. Like why? Oh, he's creative, I'm not. And there was that, that lie I was believing that I just, I wasn't creative, just period. And I was like, well, that's just something you're gifted with. Now, granted, people do have a stronger, have stronger gift in certain aspects of creativity. Like they could be a gifted writer, you know, a gifted actor, a gifted singer. Um, but talent can grow. And creativity, in my mind, is a muscle. And like any muscle that you want to grow, it requires practice, right? So in my life, in my job at the Adventure Challenge, I'm the CEO, but I do a lot of hands-on work with the creation of the books. The books all have adventure ideas. And each adventure idea is supposed to be a bit original, a bit out of the box, something that you're not going to just find on like a dating blog. Granted, you can see a lot of these ideas on dating blogs because people have bought the book and then written a blog like 10 date ideas. And I'm like, wow, word for word, that sounds really familiar. Where did you get those ideas from? Whatever. I'm not bitter about it. 
But so for a while, every single day I was sitting in my room with a notebook and pen and writing out creative ideas. I'd close my eyes and just think like, okay, I'm walking in the rain. What do I want to do in the rain? That's adventurous. Okay. I'm at home alone and it's raining outside or I'm home alone and I'm doing this. And I, I would put myself in these mental situations. I would imagine it. And then I would be like, what sounds like fun right now? And these organic and original ideas would start to flow, but it wasn't it wasn't immediate. It took a bit of practice, a bit of time. And so now when I'm sitting in a room and someone goes, let's come up with a game idea. Let's do something fun. And instantly I'm like, oh, I got an idea. Let's just grab these things. Let's grab that thing. We'll put them together. We'll make this fun game. But that's, that, that was a, a, creative, a creative muscle that I continue to work on, exercise, exercise. Same with copywriting. So for, for copywriting is a very... Uh, important skill to have, especially in growing a company, building a business. It's just like hiring a good copywriter is life and death. <laughs> you know, um, I never considered myself to really be a good writer until I was put into the position of having to come up with copy and taglines and certain things for this certain company I worked for. And I remember this one day, I, someone was like, hey, we have these different social media posts. Can you write some copy for this? And I was thinking, man, I know so-and-so would be a lot better at this than I would. I know who so-and-so would be a lot better at this than I would. And so I sat down, though, and I just did my best. And after a couple of weeks, this person was like, wow, you're a really good copywriter. I thought, no, I'm, I mean, I'm okay, but so-and-so is better at copywriting than me. But it was like, no, I was actually growing in copywriting because I was sitting down and I was flexing and exercising that muscle and it was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And... I am actually a really good copywriter now. Whenever we release ads or we're talking about products and things like that, I have really good ideas for copy. The number one killer of creativity is comparison. And once I learned that and learned that a lot of the things I was doing in creativity, I was comparing myself to all these other people who I thought were better than me at it. Thinking like, man, well, this is okay, but this person would do better. You have no idea how, that, how hard that person has worked to get to where they're at. And maybe they do have a natural ability, but you comparing your level to their level is always going to discourage you from releasing your level because you're going to think it doesn't hit the mark. Don't submit to comparison. All right? That's what I would say. That's one of the most important things. Kill comparison. You'll grow tremendously in creativity. If you don't think you're a creative person, it's probably because you're comparing yourself to all these other creative people and saying, well, I'm not that creative. You need to tell yourself, hey, close your eyes and say, I'm a creative person. I have good ideas. <laughs> Boom. That question's done. Um, best ways to start as an entrepreneur in developing a product. So for this question, I, I have a couple of parts to it. The first part is, <laughs> you really need to find out if you're actually wanting to be an entrepreneur, right? Because if you're thinking that the entrepreneur life's going to look like, you know, you're freaking on private jets and doing all this crazy stuff and swimming in a sea of cash and, you know, all, you know, what the TV and Hollywood portrays as entrepreneurship, like, listen, that is not what entrepreneurship is. <laughs> you know, like it is entrepreneurship can provide financial freedom for sure. And it can, it can, provide a lot of success in finances. But if your sole goal in becoming an entrepreneur is the financial aspect of it, you're going to hate your life. You're going to be golden handcuffed to entrepreneurship and you're going to enjoy the money that might, may or may not come, but you're going to hate the process. Entrepreneurship is all about problem solving. If you do not like solving problems, you will hate entrepreneurship. It is every day you're putting out a fire, you're solving an issue, you're resolving conflict, you're working with different types of people, you're learning self-awareness, you're learning how to empower other people to help you on your journey. There's so many parts and processes that come to the journey of entrepreneurship. It's like, if you're not ready to be a problem solver, then don't get into entrepreneurship, first of all. And the second part of this question says, develop a product. So for me, this, is, this was never a question for me. How do I develop a product? As an entrepreneur, I never thought that. If I had an idea, it wasn't, well, I can't do anything because I don't know how to develop a product. It was, what can I do right now to take steps in the direction to develop this product? Right. So when I started my company, The Adventure Challenge, 
it's, you know, it's a scratch off adventure book. It's a book filled with adventures, but it has, you know, you're supposed to scratch off the square. The square tells you what to do. You go on the adventure, you take a picture with a Polaroid camera, and then you stick it um, in the book next to the adventure. That was the original idea. It, it hasn't been made before. It was a completely original new idea. So I'm Googling where scratch off books, you know, looking for some company that remotely does what my idea was. And nobody did. Nobody had created a scratch off book like that. And so in my head, I thought, well, I'm just going to go to the craft store and I'm going to make a prototype example, even if it's a crappy example. So I went to Joanne's fabric and art store. I bought a tiny little notebook brought it home, went on amazon.com, bought, searched high and low for scratch off material because people use scratch off material all the time for like weddings and baby showers and coupons and things like that. So I knew scratcher material existed. So I was like, I'm just going to buy scratcher material. I'm going to take it and put it in the book and then I'll go from there. So that's what I did. I bought the scrapbook. Uh, I bought the notebook. I bought the scratcher material. And then I literally just cut squares out of the scratcher material and then stuck it over the ideas that I had handwritten into the book. I still have the first prototype of the Adventure Challenge. It's actually really weird if you look at it. It looks so janky and ugly. But it was the very beginning. And then I was like, okay, well, now I need a, pl a, a place to stick a Polaroid picture next to the adventure. So how do I do that? Do I just put double-sided tape? But how do you keep the tape covered? So I literally bought double-sided tape and then put a piece of paper over the other side, but then it would rip... But I, and then I finally, I finally found it online. It was double-sided photo tape. So you could, put, you could stick one side of the strip down. And then when you're ready to put a photo, you strip the peel off and you stick the photo on. So I found that and I cut it into little strips and just kind of glued it right next to the adventure. And that's how I made my first prototype. And then I had a friend who partnered with me and was like, hey, can you help me make a better prototype? And she was like, 100%. So she partnered with me and then we literally were doing it on the computer. We were typing out the adventures, printing out the pages, cutting the squares of scratcher, placing it by hand, cutting the double-sided tape, putting it by hand, and now we had the second prototype. It looked a lot better. I'll even show you a picture of the second prototype here. And then it was like, okay, now how do we do the third prototype? So I called a print shop here in Reading and said, hey, how can, can you guys laminate this book with scratcher material. And they said, no, we can't do that, but we can print off the pages for you so it looks really professional. So that's what they did. They printed off the picture, they printed off the pages for the Adventure Challenge book. And then again, by hand, I cut off the scratcher material and place it over that. And then I had a random meeting with another entrepreneur. And I said, hey, I have this book idea. This is what I'm doing. And I showed him my third prototype. And because I had something to show him, a visual where he could take his imagination and, and fill in the rest of the details. He looked at it and goes, oh, I have a contact in China that I could get you and they can make this product for you. And I was like, oh, really? Can they put the scratch material on and everything? And he said, yeah, probably they can pretty much do everything. So he gave me this contact. It was an amazing contact. Emailed this lady and I said, hey, I took a video of the book. I said, this is my book. I need, it, I need you to place the scratcher material over it, and I need you to place these strips of double-sided photo tape on it as well. Can you do that? And she goes, yes. <laughs> Just, yeah, we could do that. And I was like, no, no, I don't think you understand. Like, you're going to have to put scratcher material over the adventure. I don't want to get the book without scratcher material. You need to put it over each adventure. And she's like, yeah, we can do that. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. She's going to send me a book. And so I uh, sent her the video of my book. I, it was like 300 bucks for a prototype. Two weeks later in the mail, I got it. And it was amazing. She had literally gone to this machine and put the book through a machine that laminated each adventure with this scratcher material. And then also by hand, they placed the uh, double-sided photo tape. So it was a little bit crooked because they, they were just all doing it by hand at the very beginning. And then they had another machine eventually that could laminate, it, laminate the books with the, the uh, double-sided photo tape. So I probably did that four or five times in China. They would send me a sample. I'd go, oh, this is great. Can you change this? And they go, sure. Another $300. <laughs> it was an expensive process. And I kept doing that back and forth. And before we knew it, we had a beautiful product, a product that never existed before. And now over half a million Americans have this product. Like it's literally like it didn't exist. And now hundreds of thousands of people own this product. And the, 
I've told this story to a few people who are like, I have a product I want to design. And I tell my story and they're like, yeah, well, my product's like made of metal and it's a piece of technology and blah, blah, blah. All these excuses. And I'm like, have you tried? Have you gone into your workshop and made it with wood? You know, like using wood or plastic and then taking a video and showing a friend who knows how to use AutoCAD uh, software or some kind of 3D design program so they can actually see what you're talking about in person and then help design it. Then you can send those designs to a manufacturer who can then create a prototype. Like I, I people, I, I literally get this question asked all the time. Like I have this idea for a product. How do I go about making it? I'm like, you just effing do it. You literally do what you can with what you can. Every but entrepreneurship, everyone is looking 10 doors down the road and they're going, I don't know how I'm going to get through door number 10. And I'm like, bro, you haven't even gone through door number one. And the crazy thing about momentum is in entrepreneurship is when you walk through door number one, door number two finds a way to open itself. Not door number four, not door number five, door number two. But everyone's so focused on all the steps ahead. It's like, look what's right in front of you. Make a prototype with weird plastic and foam. And then eventually 10 doors down, it's going to be your perfect, beautiful product and perfect packaging. And you're going to get a great margin and a good price. And, but stop looking so far down the road and being like, I can't do that. It's too much work. No, freaking go to Hobby Lobby and buy a piece of wood and carve it out. Like people like it's, it's, it really, that, that part is really not that hard, but it is a process. It, it, it takes time and patience, right? Problem solving. You're like, okay, well, I don't have access to AutoCAD or 3D printer. So what can I do? Well, I can draw really well. I'm just going to draw it out with really detailed description. And then I'm going to give it to my friend who knows how to work this software and can give me a 3D print or something. It's literally just one step at a time. Stop looking at door number 10 when you haven't even walked through door number one. That's all I have to say about that question. I would say, guys, quit trying to have the whole process figured out and just get started. Because people are creating problems, people are creating problems in their head before they even exist. So you're like, oh, I want to do this idea, but oh, but what about packaging? What about this? Oh, how am I going to do marketing? What kind of commercial am I going to make for it? Like, dude, you don't even have a product yet. You know, we fail a hundred times more in our heads than we actually do in real life. That's a fact. We fail a hundred times more in our heads than we do in our minds. We create way more problems for ourselves than actually exist. So I don't want to hear about how am I going to take this to market when you haven't even figured out how am I going to make a crappy prototype to pitch an investor or to show an investor. Good Lord. <laughs> I love that question though. You know, I think it's, I think it's a lot of fun because I'm like, honestly, there is no easy answer. You literally just take the steps that's in front of you. All right. This is a funny question. At what age is a person too old to start pursuing their dream of becoming a pop star? <laughs> I don't know if you're serious with this question. Or you're joking with this question, but I'm going to answer as if somebody asked me this question and they were being serious. At what age? And honestly, and I, you're, you're talking to somebody who's never been a pop star, somebody who's not like famous. So I don't have the <laughs> educated answer for this, but this is what I would tell you if you're wanting to be quote unquote a pop star. My question would be, do you actually want to be a pop star or do you want to make a living pursuing music? Okay, so when someone says, I want to be a pop star, I hear, okay, I want to be famous, right? So it is a pop star, popular music star, a star. Is that what you're wanting to be? Are you wanting to be famous or are you wanting to make music? Now, there's no wrong answer. You can say, I want to be famous and there's no shame, you know? Like, that's fine. If your goal is to be famous, awesome. It's just your chances of becoming famous are 0.001%. So it's like, there's not much you can really do besides there's a lot of, there's, I mean, there's a lot of hard work and passion and pursuit that goes into it, but you can't control you becoming famous or not. Like that's kind of out of your control. You can do everything right and still fall short of that goal, but you can 100% achieve the goal of making a career out of your music and coming alive and, and making art and doing what you love and pursue in the process and all that kind of stuff. So for me, like, um, I love acting. Acting is one of my favorite forms of art. And uh, my goal is never to be famous, you know, in acting. 
Although that would be awesome. I would love for people all around the world to see projects I've acted in or performed in or whatever. I also love directing and writing. Um, but if my goal is to be famous, then it's like the whole journey and the whole process just isn't fun. Like I get so excited at the thought, like I've done a lot of independent film, a lot of student film and projects, commercial, things like that. I love being on set. Being on set is so much fun. Like it just gives, it makes me feel so giddy inside. I could, I could do 18 hour days for free. I don't even care. It's just so fun. I love the process. I love the work. So becoming famous or becoming known is completely irrelevant to me. It's like, no, th right now, this is the fun stuff. Obviously, it would be fun to be famous, but that's not the goal. So first I'd ask, what is, is your goal to be a pop star or is your goal to be a musician? Um, and if your goal is to be a musician, I would honestly say set yourself up for success so you can give yourself more time to pursue the craft of music. So there's a lot of musicians that I know and they're kind of a victim to their circumstances. They're all like, oh, I want to pursue this, but I don't got no money to make an EP. Like, I, I, I'm, I, 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 have you even written songs yet for an EP? No, because I don't have the money to pursue it. It's like, okay, there you are again, looking 10 doors down instead of the door right in front of you. Why don't you write music as if the finances are going to be there to record the EP? Why don't you do everything in your power ahead of time to get to the place to when the money's there, if someone said, hey, I got 10 grand for you to film an EP, are you ready to go tomorrow? You're like, yep, I'm ready to go right now. If you're not prepared up to that point, then dude, what are you even doing? You're, you're stressing yourself out and you're thinking of all these things you have to come up with and do before you're even prepared. I think Will Smith said it. He said, success comes when preparation meets opportunity. Success comes when preparation meets opportunity. What happens when opportunity hits and you're not prepared? You fall flat on your face, you call it a failure, but it was really a loss. There was no failure, you weren't prepared. You swang in the dark and missed because you weren't prepared. That I never wanna be in that place. I never wanna be in a place where someone goes, here, I'm offering you an opportunity to, to pursue your dream. And I'm like, oh, I've always wanted that, but I, I, I'm not prepared because I didn't actually believe it would come to me. That's annoying. So that I, I have a hard time uh, with that. And so my own life, it's like, I will always be prepared for the things I'm wanting to do when they're presented to me. And the next thing is, as a musician, if you're gonna be a musician and pursue that, if you're gonna pursue really any form of art as, a, you know, in life, it's like, all right, it is, guys, it is really hard to make money in, with art. Like, it is. Like, it is so hard to make money being a musician. It's so hard to make money by, with painting, with acting. Like, it is incredibly challenging to sustain yourself with that until you have a lot of momentum and a lot of people listening. And even then, I mean, I know people who are, you know, on Spotify will have 100,000 monthly listeners and they're still not making enough to support themselves. And so I would say, let's be strategic about it. And obviously I'm not dogging on the artists who release GoFundMes and Kickstarters and they're like, fund my project. I think that's great. The thing is, is I see artists, they become a victim to those things not getting funded. They're like, well, at least a Kickstarter and nobody, nobody gave me any money, so I can't do this. And I'm like, well, dude, being an artist is being an entrepreneur. <laughs> you realize that like you're, you're a set, you are the business, your, your craft, your talent is the business. So what are you doing in order to set yourself up for success? I talked to this one girl and she's, she's like, I want to be a singer. I want to release music and I want to make a living off that. And I said, okay, so what do you do right now? I, well, I said, I said, hey, so how are you going to do it? She's like, well, I need like $10,000 to do this EP. And I said, okay, well, so you, uh, well, how, you know, obviously, what do you do right now for a living? She goes, well, I clean houses. And I said, okay, so do you make enough cleaning houses to put some money aside to where you can eventually save up and make your own EP? She goes, no, I just make enough to live right now. And I said, okay, how about we start a cleaning company? Because right now you work for somebody, you're getting $20 an hour, right? And you're working for somebody else. Why don't you start your own cleaning business? and you find your own clients and you charge 40 an hour, right? So now you're obviously doing the work to find your own clients, but you're making twice as much because you're not working for somebody. It takes a little bit more work, but it pays a lot more. And then after you get 10 clients, now you hire a student, a college student to come work for you and you pay them 20 an hour to do the cleaning. And so you're getting $40 an hour, you're paying the student 20 an hour, 
and you're profiting 20 an hour for doing none of the work. Now you've just replaced, now you're not doing any work and you're making the same amount of money as you were when you were doing all of the work. It just takes a little bit more preparation, a little bit more work. Now you get 10 more clients. Now you've doubled your income and you're still not doing the actual cleaning. You're just managing the person who's doing the cleaning and you're finding new clients. A lot less work than scrubbing the toilet yourself and vacuuming and dusting and all that kind of stuff. So now you've essentially doubled your income. And now that you've doubled your income, you can definitely put some money aside for that EP. And then take it a step further. Maybe you now have 40 clients. So you've quadrupled your income. Now you can hire somebody to manage the employee and manage getting new clients. So all you're doing is watching as this company is growing and this person is getting new clients, this person's doing the work, you're making you know, $15 per hour that your cleaner's working and now you're not even working and you're, you've quadrupled your income. And now you have the money to pour into your music. And now you can even do music way more because you're not actually spending all of your time cleaning toilets you're just managing the person who's managing the cleaner and you're making four times more cash. And this is what she told me. She said, oh, I don't wanna have a cleaning business. Like as if it was like, oh, I don't wanna have a cleaning business. That's, it. and I was like, how is that any more humiliating than being a cleaner? Like why, why is owning a cleaning company below you? Like <laughs> you're, you are the cleaner. Why not just go three levels up and be the CEO of a cleaning company and then you can pursue your music full time and you can fund it yourself and you're not a victim to other people not giving you money so you can pursue it. So many people will not achieve their dreams because they're depending upon everybody else and they're a victim to their circumstances. If you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be successful, you have to take full responsibility for why you're not successful. Why aren't you successful? Well, so-and-so and blah, blah. No, it is your fault. You may have had things come at you that suck and outward circumstances that make it challenging, but it's overcoming those obstacles, saying, hey, I'm a powerful person. I have all of these obstacles. I'm going to overcome each one. I'm going to be strategic. Being an entrepreneur is being a, solvent, a problem solver. You want to be an artist, a musician, an actor, a painter, and you want to sustain and support yourself while you're doing that, Make a business, create a way, create an ecosystem that generates money and pays you while you're off pursuing your craft. And then you're, you're essentially living your dream, right? You're, you're being paid to be, you're, 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 you're being paid to be a musician. You're being paid because of your company, but you don't have to worry about the money. Like, it, so that, that's what I would ask yourself. If you want to be a pop star, your best shot at being a pop star is giving yourself all of the time in the world to pursue your music. You're not going to become a pop star working on your music two hours a week. You know, it's a full-time job for many, 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 many years. And maybe you get famous. Awesome. But that's not the goal. The goal is not to get famous. The goal is to have fun and enjoy life and to come alive in what you're doing. And if you're coming alive because you're performing at all these different shows and you're releasing albums and EPs and you're having so much fun, like who cares if you're famous? You're still living your dream, right? I feel like, man, I feel like uh, happiness attracts success. When you're like happy and you're in your groove and you're making music and you're doing it because of the fun of it and not because you need to in order to survive, like you breed so much success. Success is attracted to that. That's what I'd say about that. You're going to be a pop star. Figure out a way to support yourself while you pursue that dream full time. Another question, is there a boundary to failure? If an employee keeps failing, when do you fire him? Why is it a him? Why not a her? I'm just kidding. Maybe I should edit that out. No, I'm not going to edit that out. That was funny. <laughs> if an employee keeps failing, when do you fire him? To me, there is a big difference between losing and failing. And I've said this on the podcast a few different times. Failing is when you come prepared and you swing and you miss, right? That's failing because you can learn from that. Oh, what can I do differently? How can I prepare differently? How can I set myself up for success differently? Okay, I'm going to try it again. Boom. Losing is when you don't 
prepare and you're not actually giving your full effort and then you swing and miss. What'd you, what'd you learn from that? Nothing. You just wasted your freaking time. You just wasted your freaking time. And I, I see this all the time. I, I see this all the time with people. They, you know, they go up and they get, they get given an opportunity to do something, whether it's public speaking or it's stand-up comedy or it's performing at an open mic or it's being at a, uh, an art show or whatever. And they wait till the last minute an hour before they're supposed to do their thing, and they're like, oh, I'm writing this stuff, and, I, and they get on stage, and they flop, and they're like, oh, I failed. No, you didn't fail. You lost because you were unprepared. You were lazy. I know that's harsh. That sounds really harsh. I mean, I'm not trying to be harsh, but this is just, I see it so much, and it's so frustrating. So there's a huge difference in my mind between failing and losing. When an employee takes a risk, and they show up prepared, and they've done their homework, and they've given me 110%, and they fail, it's like, good job, let's try it again. Laziness, though, when an employee shows up and they don't try or they throw something together last minute and it's like, dude, this is a loss, you lost. This wasn't a fail, you didn't try, you were being lazy. I can't tolerate laziness. So that's unfortunately when I would let somebody go in that incidence is when I see that they're showing up unprepared they're not giving 100%, and they're just swinging all over the place and missing. And it's like, whoa, dude, you're not, even tr you're not even giving yourself a chance to succeed here. So that's kind of the boundary I hold. I'm like, as long as I see that they're giving 110%, like, I think they're a valuable person because they're going to hit it eventually. I've had to fire five. So I have 45 employees and um, eight students. We have a school of, for entrepreneurs here. This is our first year of doing the school. We have eight students this year and 45 employees. I've had to fire five people since starting the adventure challenge. And each time it sucked. It sucks to fire somebody. Dear God, I all I always it is. As soon as I realize I have to fire somebody, that whole day my stomach is in knots and I'm like, I gotta let this person go. And this person's gonna hate me. And oh man. It's always a bummer. It's never fun. Then that person hates you afterwards, like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> like I'm so sorry I tried um, it's actually worse though when you have managers over employees and the managers are like hey we need to let this person go this person's not a good fit for the environment here's why blah 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 blah, blah. and I'm like I thought that person was really fun though I like that person but obviously I'm not around them to see their performance and their work and what they're doing and whether they're showing up whether they're being lazy or not and so that's a real bummer when I have to fire someone for that you know but we never fire anybody who gives their their full effort and they show it prepared and they just lose. Like, I would never fire somebody for that. It's always the other. It's always in like, hey, this person's not showing up. This person isn't go taking, isn't going the extra mile. This person isn't showing up prepared. Like, this person's not being a good culture fit. We got to let them go. And it's like, shit. All right. Just let them go. Hope that answers your question. All right, I just got, I uh, did a little Instagram thing right before I started this thing and was like, hey, who, uh, who has questions? DM me in 20 minutes, I'm going to reply. All of the questions, like I got four questions here. One is, would you sing for us? No, I will not sing for you. Here's the thing. I will sing for my wife when I get married, if she wants me to sing. I will not sing for anybody else unless it's in a movie and they force me to. I sang in acting school. They made me sing. Like, I ain't going to sing on this podcast. So I'm sorry. Favorite pastime. Uh, that varies from season to season. I think when my shoulder was healthy, I had shoulder surgery about six months ago. So I'm still recovering. I love doing skydiving, snowboarding, uh, wakeboarding, cliff jumping, all that kind of stuff. Snorkeling. I love that type of stuff. But I, I can't really do that right now because my shoulder is still in recovery. So a lot of things I really enjoy doing now is I love jet skiing. I think that's a lot of fun. Um, I love writing. <laughs> I love working. <laughs> I really like working. I like recording. I like podcasts. This is honestly a lot of the stuff I do is just, it makes me come alive. So it doesn't really feel like work to me. Um, I'm getting better. I need to, I need to come up with more pastime things to do to turn my brain off and just relax. Um, yeah. What was the climax moment in your life where you knew life wasn't going to be the same? I'm, so I actually have an episode 
I'm going to be filming in a couple of weeks. It's called uh, <laughs> Confessions of a Millionaire Manchild. <laughs> and the whole episode is going to be talking about my journey of going from broke to multimillionaire as a young guy. And it's, it's going to be a very vulnerable episode. Um, because the process of that happened really fast. And it caused a lot of emotional, mental, and health problems because of the stress that came with all of that. And, but it was probably the winter of um, uh, 2018, Christmas, when the company literally exploded and we started doing crazy numbers in sales. And at that point, I remember being like, oh, this life will not go back to normal. This is a completely new era for me. And it was. We went from 10 employees to 20 employees to 30 employees to 40 employees and started generally generating millions and millions of dollars of revenue. And it, it happened so fast that my brain didn't even have time to catch up with it. It was just like one day I'm in crazy amounts of debt trying to start a company the next week, I'm making $2,000 a month of income. And then the next <laughs> couple months, I'm a millionaire. And there's a lot of story behind that. And um, I'm not going to go into it fully, but that was definitely a point where I was like, yep, this is, uh, life will not be the same. This is definitely a new season. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, it's not as fulfilling as you would expect. The money aspect is not as fulfilling as you would expect. And I mean, we hear that all the time, you know, <laughs> uh, money doesn't make happiness. And I think a lot of us are like, yeah, yeah, but what you can do with the money makes you happy. You know what? Surprisingly, no, it doesn't. Um, that's another question I have from somebody. <laughs> he said, what you going to do with all your money? <laughs> and I'm sorry to disappoint you with what my answer is going to be, but honestly, I really enjoy building things. I enjoy building. I enjoy starting new companies. I enjoy pursuing my dreams. I enjoy empowering other entrepreneurs. I enjoy empowering other um, dreamers. I enjoy giving. I swear to God, all of the buying shit and all that gets old so fast. It does not bring you any fulfillment. So anyways, that episode, Confessions of a Millionaire Manchild, to your podcast store soon. Well, not store. It's not really a store. You don't pay for this podcast. That'd be kind of cool, though, if you got paid to do the podcast, which I know you can add ads to it and stuff like that, and you can do promote, be, get promoted, and I'm just like, but, but it'd be kind of cool, right? It'd be cool if you could get tipped in your podcast. Like, that's a good episode. Here's $5. That'd be fun, right? <laughs> Anyways, I have three kids and a wife. Failure feels a lot higher stakes to me. How do I combat this? That is a good question. I get this question a lot. I am going to give a quick disclaimer. I am single. I do not have kids. So I do not have the weight of having to support an immediate family to provide for. <laughs> so obviously, how I answer this question, I want to have a lot of compassion to fathers and mothers and people who have that responsibility and that weight where it's like, hey, look, taking a risk for me feels scarier because it's not just me failing. It's like, my kids don't eat. And that's what I've, you know, had some parents come in and, and talk to me about. And so I just want to, I want to give that disclaimer. Like, look, I'm not saying I understand the stress and, and the frustration or even the, the fear that you go through before you take a risk that could result in it hurting your family. Um, I'm going to give you advice based on my perspective and my personal life experience of being a kid and coming from a family that didn't make a lot of money and also just on, like, <laughs> I'm being realistic. I'm going to be realistic with this answer. Um, first, I want to get out of the way. You know, one entrepreneur said to me, he said, uh, hey, if I fail, and if I take this risk and fail, then my family won't eat. Here's the thing. This might sound harsh, but it's just the truth. You don't have to go hungry in America. Unless, unless you're living in a, in a third world country or, or 
a place that's high poverty, like there is always ways to feed your family. My family, a lot growing up, we went to food banks. We went, we sat in line at these churches for hours and then we got boxes of food. You get food stamps, you get WIC, you get government assistance. You like, there's all of these ways to where it's like, okay, it's, if you're actually afraid of your family starving, that's a different question. But is your family actually going to starve or are they not going to get the name brand Cocoa Puffs versus the generic Cocoa Puffs? Right. So that, that, those are questions I would encourage you to ask. Like, okay, if this risk goes completely south, in my, we go bankrupt, right? We lose the house. We lose the car. We lose, are our kids going to starve? I know that's, that's dramatic, but people ask that. They're like, my kids go hungry. It's like, are they going to go hungry though? Or is there, is there it, will that make it really hard? But their, li- their very lives are not at stake. And I think people got to take that pressure. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, yeah, it could be a huge risk and cost you a lot and create some hardship. But first of all, you need to know that your family most likely is going to be okay. Right? So that's the first thing I'd say. Because growing up, and we weren't a poor family. Like my, my dad, you know, he was a pastor uh, so he didn't make good money, but he made enough. Like we, we always had clothes on our backs. We always had a roof over our head. We always had food. We never went hungry. Uh, we had vehicles, even though, you know, they were always, the vehicles were always breaking down and, you know, but we, we weren't poor. We just, we weren't like middle class or anything. You know, we just, we had enough. Uh, and then we, we, we had good Christmases. We had good birthdays. They always did the very best with what they had. So my parents, I, I love the way we were raised, even though like, I'm like, yeah, I would like to be able to have more money than that. It's like, but I was fine. Like, it wasn't traumatizing for me as a child to go to a food bank and wait in line. I didn't give a shit. I thought it was fun. We're just sitting there chilling, and then someone would deliver these boxes of food. We're like, oh, what do we get? Cool. Cheese. Eggs. Bacon. You know, it was like, and maybe it, maybe it was, it could have been more embarrassing for my parents. I don't know. I haven't asked them that. It could have felt a little more humiliating to them because they were going to a food bank. But for the kids, we were fine. We're like, oh, cool. Food in boxes. So that's what I ask yourself. Your kids really going to starve? Or are you just too prideful to have to accept help if you really need it and everything goes to shit? Which most of the time, everything doesn't go to shit. But let's just say worst case scenario, everything goes to shit. You have no money, you know? <laughs> That's what I would say about that. The second thing is, is what type of risks are you taking that are going to make you go bankrupt? I'm like, damn. Like, are you putting a million dollars on black and then just f- spinning and hoping that it lands on the color you're taking and you're betting the house and the cars with it? Like, guys, I've talked about in, the, in, in this podcast, you know, in, in failing, you take baby steps. You take a small risk. And so as a parent, somebody who has a sustainable job, they're making good money, their family is taken care of, they're paying the mortgage, they're paying the rent, they're paying the bills, and they're like, I want to take a risk and start this new business and this new company, but I'm terrified that if it, if it doesn't work, then I, we go bankrupt. It's like, well, why don't you start a side hustle and grow that and build that and pursue that until it's big enough to when you can transfer out of your nine to five into this job that's more safe, Right? Like, you don't have to just say, screw it all. It's like, well, Brian, okay, I have kids. You don't understand what it's like to have kids, all right? You have no free time on your hands. Zero. None. All right? When you have a kid, you'll understand. Once again, I'm saying, yeah, that could be true. Do you have 10 minutes a day to pursue a side business? And if you don't have 10 minutes a day, then I'm like, okay, then yeah, you're the busiest freaking dad on the planet or mom on the planet. Everybody has 10 minutes a day. While you're sitting on the toilet, you could be researching stuff for your business. You know, before you go to bed at night, you could be doing stuff. You could be typing stuff out. You know how fast 10, 15, 30 minutes a day adds up over a year? A lot more than doing zero minutes a day after a year. Guys, it, 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 it compounds. It adds. If you're a mom or a dad and you want to be an entrepreneur, but you don't want to quit and leave your job... Are you spending a few minutes every single day to pursue this side business to grow it to where you can then transfer out of your business into this business? 
Once again, if you're being a victim to your circumstances, well, I'm a dad. This guy doesn't understand. I have no free time. I know you got 10, 15 minutes, bro. Sis. (laughs) I know you have a few minutes. Okay, I don't have 10, 15 minutes a day. How about 10, 15 minutes a week? You got that? 52 weeks times 15 minutes equals mucho hours. It's a lot more hours than zero than what you're putting in right now. I feel like I'm being so harsh on this podcast. I feel sassy today. So you guys have to hear my heart. I'm literally talking to imaginary people right now, and I'm getting frustrated (laughs) at these clients. I hope you you guys can hear my heart. Hope you can see my face and know that I'm not like, you motherfucker. Like, no, no. Okay, here's the thing. I'm just like, what I get frustrated at is excuses. And the whole... Like entrepreneurship is problem solving. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, it's problem solving. It's not creating excuses. It's finding your way around them. It's finding your way around problems. Not excusing yourself for like, oh, I'm stuck. I'm a victim to this. I can't do anything about it. Yeah, you should not be an entrepreneur. You should work for somebody the rest of your life and never be an entrepreneur. The next thing I'd ask yourself as well is there could be some risks. You know, you could get to a point where your business is growing and you have to make a decision. Do I quit this successful or this job that's paying me enough money and supports my family and then pursue this dream and pursue this other job that's making some money but could fail or do I stay in this job and you you have to answer that question for yourself there's really no right or wrong answer but let me tell you as a kid I learned a lot more from my dad when he took risks and failed than when he played it safe your kids are watching you and I'm saying this from experience I was the kid watching my dad And I would notice every opportunity that came his way, he would take and try. And a lot of them failed, but I would notice, and it was ingrained into my head, oh, when you have an opportunity, you take your shot, and you'll most likely miss, but you keep shooting until you get your shot right. And that ingrained such a pursuer mentality in my head to where now I'm pursuing my dreams, and my dreams are making millions. And it was because my dad set the example, right? So what kind of, the thing you ask is, is, is what's more important, your kid getting 10 pairs of Nike kicks every year or them learning to be set up for success to pursue their dreams in a way that leads to success? It's like, yeah, you might try and fail. And maybe, yeah, you guys have a couple of shitty Christmases. You don't have enough money to buy the toys that your kids want. Spoiler alert, they'll be fine. They won't hate you. I know a lot of kids who got everything they wanted for Christmas and they're just terrible humans now. (laughs) These are questions I would ask yourself as a parent. If I was a parent, remember, I'm not saying I know everything about being a parent. I know jack shit about being a parent because I'm not a freaking parent. I'm telling you from the perspective of being a son. (laughs) I adore my parents. And they were not rich. We were not the kids who got whatever clothes we wanted. We didn't have the dream house. We didn't have all these amazing toys. We didn't have these luxurious cushions. We didn't go on luxurious family vacations. I remember in, like in vacations, you know, we're staying at Motel 6s and we're like, yeah, they got a pool and we're loving it. Yeah, new bed, six of us on one bed, let's do it. Like it was fun, it was adventurous. And then I had friends who were, you know, going to the Maldives every freaking summer and they were just rotten kids. <laughs> character speaks a lot louder than money when you're raising your kids. Ooh, that's good. I'm going to have a bunch of parents messaging me. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. You know, this is, this is me doing just the best I can with the experience that I currently have. So, so if I'm being, if I'm being realistic with any, any parents or people who are, you know, have, who feel like they have a lot, more to lose by taking a risk and failing. I would challenge you and say that one of the bigger fears you have is not being unable to provide for your family, but it's it hurts your pride that you're not able to give them what you want to give them. It hurts your pride that the Jones, the neighbors next door, see that you're driving, you know, a 1980 Volkswagen weather instead of a 2021 Tesla. Not all of it. I know not all of it is coming from that, but I'm just saying there is an element of pride that comes into, you know, being afraid of failing. It's like if you go down to the facts, write the facts down, what's actually at stake here? 
Am I willing to risk this? No. Okay, so how can I mediate the risk? How can I, you know, make it not so intense? Okay, I'll commit a little bit of time and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Okay, there's, there, there, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the bigger things that a lot of people are afraid of failure is because of letting their family down. I totally get that. So outside of that, outside of letting a family down, why are we afraid to lose? Why are you afraid to lose? Why are you afraid to fail? This is a good question. Ask yourself. Sit down and go, hey, why are you afraid to fail? 90% of the time it comes down because it comes down to we are afraid of what people will think about us when we fail. <laughs> We're afraid of what they think of us. Are you afraid of failing when you're all alone? No. Are you afraid of sounding stupid by singing alone? No, I sing alone a lot. Miss, please sing on your podcast, person who asked that question. I sing in the shower all the time. I sing at home when nobody's listening. Why? I'm not afraid of sounding like an idiot when I'm by myself. I'm afraid of sounding like an idiot when I'm in front of other people so I don't sing. Hey, I'm entitled to my insecurities. You guys can't get mad at me for that kind of stuff. But no, really, like we're, we're, most of us are afraid to fail because we're afraid of what other people think. Fear of man will prevent you from taking risk, Right? Lose the fear of man, lose the fear of failing. How do we do that? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. How do we lose the fear of man so we lose the fear of failing? We take baby steps. Hey, that was actually singing. That was like a jingle singing, but it was nonetheless singing. So I just, there you guys go. Congratulations. You lose the fear of man, you lose the fear of failing. How do you lose the fear of failing? You take baby steps. Once you start to realize that we fail a hundred times more in our brain than we do in real life, you're going to lose the intensity that you feel, that traumatic feeling you feel when you're like, before you take a risk. <laughs> you're like, oh no, if I take this risk, I'm going to fall flat on my face and everyone's going to think I'm an idiot. No one's going to think you're an idiot. The person who does think you're an idiot, they're just too scared to take risks themselves, so they spend all their time judging other people who take risks. The only people who are going to judge you for taking risks are the ones who are too afraid to take risks themselves as well. And they have a lot of fun pointing the finger and going, this person's not that good at blah, 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 because they do blah, blah, blah. It's like, yo, until you step into the arena and take those risks, you just shut your mouth. Brene Brown says something like that. She says, well, it's not Brene Brown. It was Teddy Roosevelt, but she quoted him, and it was like, the only person, only voice that matters is the people who are in the arena with you, Right? So people who understand what it's like to take risks and overcoming that fear, they're not casting judgment at you. They're not making fun of you behind your back. They're not teasing. They're literally like, yeah, good job. I know what that's like. Good job. You failed. And all the other people's voices, they don't matter. It's like, wh wh why would you care? <laughs> like, why, why would you care about what they think? They're not even doing anything with their life. They're, not, they're literally doing nothing with their life. And they're judging you for making moves and taking risks because you want to do something with your life right? The most judgmental singers are the ones who literally are doing nothing themselves. And they have opinions about every other singer in the room. Oh, well, this person, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. The people who are doing it, man, the people who are grinding and they're putting in the work and they're taking risks and they're falling on their face, like they're literally looking at the other people failing and they're going, oh man, good job. Unless you're a terrible human being in that case, there's no help. Just kidding. <laughs> Baby steps, smaller risks. The more you take baby, the more you f you take these small risks and realize that failure shows up a lot less often than you assume. The more excited you are to take risks because you're like, oh, actually, what I am assuming will happen most likely won't. Like I'm not gonna fall on my face and look like a complete idiot. I I may embarrass myself, but I know it's not that bad. And once you actually fail, you go, oh, whew, how was that? I'm alive. I'm here. I'm still good. Things are great. I'm going to do it again. And you keep taking those baby steps. Fail, 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 fail. You start to realize, wow, this actually isn't that big of a deal. And you start to lose a little bit of that fear of man because you're not actually afraid of what they're thinking of you because you're like, oh, no, I can fail and it's okay. And People really are more focused on themselves than they are with me anyways. 
So guys, honestly, it's actually funny because every single one of these questions goes back to really one thing. The first thing is don't look 10 doors down and complain and wonder how that door is going to open when you haven't walked through the first door. The second thing for people taking risk, people taking risks who have family and people they're afraid of disappointing in that regard is to mediate the risk, build it on the side, take baby steps in growing something. And then ask yourself when you're going to take a big risk, what's the worst that could actually happen? Is my family going to starve? Are we actually going to lose everything? Or is it just going to be money's going to be tighter? Right? It's all about baby steps. Walk through the first door. Preparation meets opportunity. That leads to success. That's all the time I have for today, guys. I'm going to go hang out with a buddy. I am exhausted. Talking in a room alone for 45 minutes to an hour is draining. Guys, thanks for listening. Please go rate, review, and subscribe. It makes me so happy when I see a review or a rating. It's dope. Thank you. And um, I would love to hear your feedback about this episode. You guys have a good day. Cheers. Cheers.